Hi, thanks for joining me. We're going to be talking about serotonin syndrome today. So the aims of this quick talk are to talk about the causes, symptoms and the diagnosis of serotonin syndrome. And that's going to be the main bulk of this talk. We'll talk a little bit about the differential diagnosis because that's quite important. And we'll briefly cover management. So let's set the scene as we've done before. So try and immerse yourself as best as you can. It's 6 p.m. on a medical ward and you get a ping on your nerve center or a bleep or whatever and you ask to see a patient because they've got a high temperature and some new onset confusion since early afternoon. The temperature is currently 39.3 degrees C. So a bit of background given over the phone. Uh, so the patient's a 44 year old female and she's in with a UTI. She's got a background of multiple UTIs and some scarred kidneys. So we know she may have resistant bugs, she may have um, recurrent infections. Her medical background, she suffers from gallstones, migraines and depression. So the reason she's had to come in for this is for intravenous antibiotics. So she's currently on paracetamol for the pain and codeine and she's on linezolid. So she's previously had three days of vancomycin when you look on the drug chart and it's been started on linezolid today. So we can assume that she probably has like a vancomycin resistant enterococcus or something like that. And she's also on venlafaxin long term. So let's do our A to E assessment. Airway is nice and patent, talking in full sentences. Breathing, SATs are fine, respiratory rate's fine, chest is nice and clear. Circulation, so she's tachycardic and she's hypertensive as well. You notice her skin is flushed. Heart sounds normal and auscultation, but you can ask for an ECG. You're also going to try and get some access and take some blood tests. Looking at D, her capillary blood glucose, which we're never going to be forgetting, is 4.9. GCS is 14, and that's because she's a little bit agitated, a little confused. Pupils are equal, they're reactive, but they are dilated to 8 millimeters. And you do notice that she's got a bit of a tremor in her hands. Temperature is indeed 39.3 degrees. And everything else, abdomen soft, but there are increased bowel sounds. You notice she's quite sweaty, no rashes, no bleeding, nothing like that. So anything else you'd want to do at this point? Well, I personally would be doing a neurological examination because she's got that tremor and this new agitation. So. We're going to do a full neuro exam. Her upper limbs, you notice some slightly increased tone when you're trying to move her arms around and that tremor is fairly prominent. Because of the agitation, it's quite difficult to measure the power reflexes or sensation. And I'm sure we've all been in the position where we've tried to do a in-depth neurological examination and it just requires a little bit more cooperation from the patient. So it can be difficult. So lower limbs, you're able to assess the tone and that's very much increased, feels almost rigid. Can't assess the power, again, quite difficult to get that cooperation, but you managed to get some knee reflexes and they are hyper reflexive, so very brisk. And there is some inducible clonus on both sides. Cranial nerve examination, probably quite difficult to do this, um, but you can have a, a good old look at the pupils again, they're dilated. And again, you notice those cheeks are flushed. So, clonus, this is probably the most unexpected finding from what we've just found. And that signifies that something different is going on. So when you recap what you're thinking about this patient, we've got a febrile tachycardic patient with new agitation or confusion. And the first thought in my head is always going to be sepsis, especially in a patient we know has an infection and is on treatment. And especially in this lady, actually, because it's resistant treatment. So sepsis should be your first thought. The point of this, though, is it shouldn't always be your only thought. And the clonus is, along with the tremor, your big clue here that something else is probably going on. And that's why the full examination is so important, and especially if there's new neurological symptoms. So we've got a new tremor, dilated pupils, and now we found that clonus as a result of our neuro exam. So you know what the diagnosis is going to be because it's the name of the lecture. So let's talk a little bit about it. The triad, 
So serotonin syndrome is defined as a triad of these three different areas of symptoms. So a change in the mental status, the autonomic hyperactivity, and neuromuscular abnormalities. And even before we go into more detail, we know this patient has all three of these. So let's have a look at this triad in a bit more detail. So before we go into the more in-depth symptoms, if you have a look on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see severity. And at the top, where we've got mild, we've also got drug side effect. That's the key thing to understand here is that you can have patients on these drugs, let's say an antidepressant and SSRI, where you might get a mild tremor or you may get dilated pupils or the patient may be a little bit more sweaty than usual. And that's not necessarily toxicity. It's a side effect of the drug. And I want you to appreciate it's a spectrum from the side effects all the way to the life threatening features we'll cover in this slide. So for our mental status, we've got on the milder side, insomnia, anxiety, restlessness. As things progress, the patient become more easily startled and agitated and go into a full blown delirium later on. For those autonomic effects, as we mentioned, those dilated pupils, vomiting and diarrhea, quite common. And remember when we listened to our lady's abdomen, we did have those increased bowel sounds. As things go on, they become hypertensive and tachycardic. And this can be unstable. The blood pressure can be very high and can quite quickly drop to being quite low as well. So bear that in mind. The sweating, the flushing, the fever, and I've put severe hypothermia afterwards because these patients can go up to above 41 degrees and that's fairly serious and needs prompt action. And then the neuromuscular side, really important, especially in the differential side of things. So your patient with side effects can just have brisk reflexes, but this can progress up to myoclonus, ocular clonus, uh, tremor, and upgoing planters. And then as things progress, that muscular rigidity, which can lead to respiratory failure. And when things get really out of control, then you get the life-threatening features, the renal failure with rhabdomyolysis, uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation, ARDS, and full-blown renal failure. And eventually, these patients can have seizures, coma, and then death. So let's look at what serotonin syndrome actually is. So it's now considered a toxidrome, so a toxicity from buildup of too much serotonin in the system. We can consider this as being either intentional or non-intentional. So an example of intentional would be um, a massive citalopram overdose so, or any other SSRI, something like that. Non-intentional is going to be when too much of a drug is given by mistake or more commonly when there's a combination of different drugs end up having this net effect on the serotonin system. And what's happening here is we're overstimulating the serotonergic receptors and the pathways. So mainly found in the neurological system, but also the gut nervous system and the platelets as well. So the serotonin receptors on the platelets can cause aggregation. And this may be why very severe serotonin syndrome causes DIC. There's no one single receptor responsible, but the 5-HT2A and B receptors are the most likely parties involved. And as I said, it's the net effect of various serotonin affecting drugs or too much of one. So I'm not going to go through the whole drug list and this is only a sample. But what I want you to note is that in the MAOI list at the end is linezolid, which we use as an antibiotic. The reason I picked it for this case is because it's thought to be the trigger for the last case I treated and we found it after quite a bit of reading. Other more likely candidates, uh, your TCAs, your SSRIs, other stimulants. I so think about patients coming in um, that have been taking ecstasy or amphetamines. Uh, on Danzatron, so if you've got someone that's come in, let, let's say an ecstasy patient that's been vomiting and you give them on Danzatron, you could well, well induce this. And herbal products, that's the other one to really zero in on in your history is are they taking any over the counters? doesn't have to be on the drug list for it to be affecting them. So always ask about anything else they're taking. So just a quick note on the MAOIs, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, 
So these can cause a more severe toxidrome than perhaps the other drugs can. And that's because a lot of these drugs are irreversible in their action. So even after the drugs washed out of the system, what they've done still remains. Not all of them are irreversible, so it's always worth checking. So let's say you stop a drug and you add in an extra serotonin drug a few days after stopping, you can still get serotonin syndrome because of the after effects of your MAOI. So the really important thing for inpatients and in this particular case is linezolid. So linezolid is an MAOI and that is important in this one. So we need to think about washout periods. So ideally in, in, in this patient, for example, you would stop the venlafaxin several days before starting linezolid. I mean, that's easier said than done. So you want to think, is it possible to do a washout period or are there alternative drugs to think about? So we use the Hunter criteria as the most effective um, out of the different criteria systems. And this is characterized by the use of at least one serotonin affecting drug plus any one of spontaneous clonus, inducible clonus and agitation or sweating, ocular clonus, tremor and hyperreflexia, or the hypotonia and hypothermia. And one of these clonuses. Okay, so if you suspect it, just look this up and see if things fit. It's very specific, but it's not always the most sensitive. I think it's about 85% sensitive, this. So by no means definitive. So let's talk about differentials. There's one very important one aside from sepsis. So we've already talked about sepsis and thinking about any neurological infections. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is the big one that seems to be confused with serotonin syndrome. We'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Malignant hypothermia is another differential, especially with those high fevers. It tends to be caused by various anesthetic agents. So you're unlikely to see it on the medical wards, but not impossible. Then anticholinergic toxicity can have some features in common. And last but not least is sedative withdrawal. So someone coming off a severe, say, benzodiazepine addiction or heavy usage may have some of these symptoms. So when we're differentiating serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome, the major things to zero in on are the onset and the course of the disease. So serotonin syndrome is all fairly rapid. Between 6 and 24 hours after the new agent is administered, it will develop and it should resolve after 24 hours once you've held back the drug. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome tends to be more with dopamine antagonists and that kicks in slowly days to weeks and the recovery is prolonged. The other difference is in the neuromuscular features really. So with serotonin syndrome you see this kind of excitable state, the big hyperreflexia, the increased tone and the tremor. With neuroleptic malignant syndrome everything is, is decreased, it's wooden their muscles are rigid, their lead pipe rigidity, the reflexes are much lower as well. Yeah, the rest of the features, let's just pause the slide and have a quick look. So let's talk about managing Our Lady. So we know she's quite toxic. She's got symptoms from all three different criteria. So we're gonna get some bloods, um, that probably during um, our A to E. So let's get a full blood count, get that renal function and liver function creating kinase to make sure she's not in rhabdomyolysis, clotting screen and blood cultures. Do a urine dip in cultures, make sure there's no myoglobin in the urine dip. And think about imaging, so a chest x-ray if we're wondering about infection, and CT head is probably gonna end up being done fairly often if we're not quite sure what's going on. And we also want to think about CSF analysis. If we're considering meningitis or encephalitis, then this may well be necessary. The hallmark of management is these three things here. So number one, fairly obvious, stop the offending drug. So with this lady, I would stop the linezolid and speak to microbiology and hold the venlafaxin and that will need to be reconsidered later. And give her some supportive care, so some fluids, cardiac monitoring, keep those sats above 94% and really just keep a close eye on her. So think about, do I need a high level of care here? Maybe ACB, something like that. 
and then for the agitation we're going to use benzodiazepine so you can use them intravenously if things are quite severe and you have access um, if not or it's possible then you can think about PO just note haloperidol is no good in this situation because it can make things worse if this doesn't work or your patient is in real trouble then you may need to think about more intensive management so this can progress rapidly and this is more likely to happen if you've had an MAOI involved ITU not unheard of if that temperature especially goes above 41 degrees then you want to think about sedating and ventilating and it's the muscle rigidity that's generating all that temperature so this isn't a fever as such in that it's not the hypothalamus causing this this is genuine heat being generated by the muscles so things like paracetamol won't work but non-pharmacological cooling measures may work so we're thinking about fans cooling blankets and so on but really important is to consider does my patient need to be ventilated and sedated for those autonomic effects the high and potentially low blood pressure you want to manage those and fast acting drugs are better because of the labile nature so rather than giving things like propanolol or anything else that lasts for a long time if you're high blood pressure you'd use nitroprusside or one of the shorter acting beta blockers on the other hand if your patient is hypotensive then a short acting sympathomimetic like one of the um, phenylephrine type drugs now if you look on tox base you'll see there is an antidote called cyprohetadine this is an h1 antagonist and also has some non-specific anti-serotonergic properties there's not a huge amount of evidence for improving outcomes but it is an option if your patient is really unwell so what will we do with this lady in the long term would you stop the venlafaxine it's a difficult question she may require the drug if she finds it works for her and she has severe depression she may need it to function if we were to continue it we definitely need to do a washout period so for example in this case we would recommend starting the venlafax in two weeks after stopping the lenezolid so remember the lenezolid is one of the maois so its effects may linger around longer even after we've stopped the drug so let's say we put her back on it and she develops some low level symptoms a little bit of flushing or dilated pupils or occasional bits of diarrhea would that necessarily be serotonin syndrome would we need to stop there's no single right answer here this is a really a balance of pros and cons I think it's very important in these cases that we have good patient education and to make sure the GP is fully in the loop when she goes home right so there we go so further reading up to date on serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome and then this paper is pretty good. Thanks for listening.